Our speaker this evening is Professor of Sacred Scripture and Theology at the Augustan Institute. Dr. Michael Patrick Barber earned his master's in theology from Franciscan University and PhD in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary. He is the author of numerous scholarly articles and publications, including The Historical Jesus and the Temple, Memory, Methodology, and the Gospel of Matthew, forthcoming from Cambridge University Press, and Paul, a New Covenant Jew, Rethinking Pauline Theology, co-written with Brant Petrie and John Kincaid. In addition to his teaching and academic research, Dr. Barber has written public-facing works, most recently, The True Meaning of Christmas, The Birth of Jesus, and the Origins of the Season. He also writes for the website, thesacredpage.com, and you can find him on Twitter at Michael P. Barber. Please join me in welcoming for our quarter finale event, Dr. Michael Barber. Welcome, Doctor. Such a blessing to have you with us today. Thank you. It's a delight to be with you all. I always relish the opportunity to talk about the infancy narratives of Jesus, and of course, at this time of the year, we're really drawn into the mystery of the nativity and so uh, i do want to just begin this this talk called the star star of wonder the mysterious magi is largely based on um, a book that i wrote called the true meaning of christmas the birth of jesus and the origins of the season it's not specifically an academic book it's really meant for anyone um, every chapter begins with a christmas song a familiar christmas song sort of uses that as the launching a uh, pad for conversation about what is the meaning of Christmas. And then at, at the beginning, we talk about the biblical narratives. It's really most of the book. Then at the end, we talk about uh, how do we know that the biblical story isn't simply mythology? Is this rooted in history in some way? Some people like to say this is just warmed over mythology or, or, or pagan thought. Um, and I get into how did we end up celebrating Christmas on December 25th? How did we end up with Christmas trees? Who is St. Nicholas? What do we really know about St. Nicholas? Uh, he didn't punch any heretics. Um, I'll tell you that. Spoiler alert. Um, but we do know quite a bit about him. There are some really old traditions that are really beautiful. And what ends up happening is Amer in America is striking a Protestant country ends up thinking that they need a patron saint. And so in New York City, you start seeing Protestants begin to honor St. Nicholas. It's a really remarkable story. And then I get into Charles Dickens and some other things, you know, the crutch, why do we have Christmas lights, lots of other things. So I wanna encourage you if, you, if you haven't read it already, here's the book, The True Meaning of Christmas, The Birth of Jesus and the Origins of the Season. And we have a really nice hardcover edition. And my hope is that this is the time of year where you could talk to people about Jesus. And so, so many people want to have a meaningful Christmas. Right now is the time people are singing these songs, I'll be home for Christmas, if only in my dreams. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, things like that. Uh, people are longing for homecoming and uh, for family at this time of year. So many people are down during the Christmas season. I don't think we should feel down. Uh, I don't think that we should ever imagine that uh, Christmas is unfulfilled or longing for Christmas is unfulfilled, because if we understand the meaning of Christmas in Scripture, if we root our understanding of Christmas in Christ's mass, that's what Christmas means, uh, then we, we can't be disappointed. And so this is the time of year you can talk about the baby in the manger. So if there's someone that's fallen away from the faith, if there's someone that you would love to be able to talk about the gospel to and you normally can't, hopefully this is a good gift uh, at Christmas time uh, for them. The true meaning of Christmas, the birth of Jesus and the origins of the season. And so in one of the chapters, I begin with a song I think many people know. Words go something like this, O star of wonder, star of night star with royal beauty bright westward leading still proceeding guide us to thy perfect 
light. We Three Kings, traditional Christmas hymn. What is going on in the story? What is the star? And who are these figures that are advancing to Bethlehem? That's what this talk is really all about. And I hope to maybe answer some questions people have. And I believe the more you study the Bible, the more you fall in love with it. And so I hope that the more you know about the biblical story, and not just, you know, myths about the biblical story, but the more we know about the biblical story itself, uh, the, the better we'll appreciate it. So who are the Magi? Let's get right into it. Let's look at the story as we find it in the Gospel of Matthew. Of course, the account of the Magi only found in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 2, we read, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod the king, behold, Magi, there's that word, sometimes it's referred to as, they're referred to as wise men, why is that? We'll talk about this in a, in a minute. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star at its rising and have come to worship him. All right, so right there I highlighted that word magi. Um, magi is plural. It comes from a Greek word, magos. Um, it's actually magi, it's through the Latinization of the word. Magos is a single, a singular uh, word. Um, who are these guys? What's going on with the magi? Well, the word magi has all sorts of connotations. There's just a recently a book, this is a, a more academic book than mine, the Magi, who they were, how they've been remembered, and why they still fascinate. Eric van den Eichel, published by Fortress Press, just came out uh, this year. I just read it about two weeks ago. Uh, I bought it at Society of Biblical Literature. I don't agree with everything in the book, but it is a, it is a really helpful overview of so many of the issues. There's a lot there uh, that's extremely helpful. Um, but, you know, scholars, we always quibble with each other, and he's not writing from a Catholic perspective, so there's going to be some natural differences there. But who are magi? Well, there are lots of different meanings of the term in, the, in ancient literature. Uh, often they refer to priestly figures that came from media that especially rose to prominence in the Persian Empire. So when people hear magi, they often think of Persia. What a lot of people don't know is that Magi weren't just in Persia. Uh, they were also in Babylon. And I find this fascinating. In the book of Daniel, we actually find that Greek word in the Greek version of Daniel. We find the word Magi. They're grouped with the wise men. So I wonder why we call Magi wise men. Well, this is why. In Daniel chapter 2, now this is the Greek version, so that's why it says LXX there. The 70, the Septuagint is the tradition, the legend that the, the Septuagint was translated by 70 elders. We read, the king said, tell me the dream. He's asking all the, the wise men in the court, tell me my dream, and then I'll know the interpretation that you show me, that, that I know that you can show me its interpretation. So Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I had a dream. I want you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And the people in the court are astonished. So nobody ever asks for this, right? I mean, it's one thing to tell us about your dream and we can interpret it to you, but we, didn't, we can't tell you your dream. That's going too far. We read the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, answered the king. There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any wise man or magi. So we see the magi grouped with the wise men here. So this is why in the tradition we often call the magi wise men. They're part of this larger group of, of skilled individuals, men with great knowledge, men with learning, right, in Daniel chapter 2. More broadly, we can uh, quote here from W.D. Davies and Dale Allison. They wrote the, what is, in my opinion, the most significant um, modern commentary on Matthew, most thorough on the Greek text. Again, not written by Catholics. We're going to 
zig and zag in different places, st still it's still considered the the most uh, complete commentary on Matthew written by modern scholars. Who are Magi? More generally, Davies and Allison say Magi can often refer to those who possessed superior knowledge and ability, including astrologers, oriental sages, and soothsayers in general. So not, not just, you know, wise men, but people who had ability to know things. Now, you hear the word uh, magi, and we think of them as wise men. It's important to know, just for context, that Gentiles often saw magi as charlatans. They dismiss them. But they're they're going to give me some secret knowledge about something. They can interpret dreams. These guys are frauds. And you, you see that in places like Plato, right? I don't mean the toy that kids play with. I mean the philosopher, the Greek philosopher, Plato, and other ancient writers. And one thing that's fascinating in ancient literature is we often see magi being attracted to royal courts. They're often involved in political intrigue in some way. So that's significant because, of course, in the story in Matthew's gospel, who are they coming to look for? A king. And they're going to end up in Herod's court, right? So it sort of fits what we know about magi. Now, when we hear the word magi, you can hear magic, right? You, you can tell there might be a connection between magi and magic. And in fact, in Jewish sources, magi are linked to sorcerers. So there are lots of different connotations here. Sometimes people see them as frauds. Sometimes they're Persian priests. But they can also be associated with sorcery, which is, of course, a capital crime in, in Exodus and Deuteronomy. They're, they're also linked, the Magi also linked with the occult, with demonic forces. You see that, for example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which, not the Dead Sea Squirrels, that's not as exciting. The Dead Sea Scrolls, are these documents that were sent, found in about 1947. They're the greatest archeological discovery of the 20th century. Biblical texts uh, were found there, which is really remarkable. Our oldest complete manuscript before the Dead Sea Scrolls goes to 1000 AD, right? So we have fragments and we have a copy of a copy, but the oldest surviving text really is, is ancient. Um, now with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have texts that go back to Jesus' own day. So people would say, well, yeah, we have these later manuscripts of the Bible. How do we know that they were copied correctly? Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls indicate that they were actually copied correctly. It's kind of a freak of nature type thing where these scrolls were preserved because they were in these jars that were covered basically with bat excrement. And the bat excrement sealed up the jars and preserved the scrolls. And once they came out and the scholars were they were like, you know, disappearing in their hands because they were dry and brittle and anyway, but they took a lot of photos and they were able to preserve many of them even to this day. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Magi are linked to the occult, to demonic powers. Now, let's get to the New Testament. In, we see them in, in the Magi in Matthew, but Magi aren't only found in Matthew, they're also found in the book of Acts. Isn't that interesting? In the book of Acts, we actually have a kind of combination of different views. So we read about one guy in the book of Acts named Simon Magus, and he's clearly capable of doing supernatural things. So he's not just a fraud in Acts, he actually has real powers. And then later in Acts 13, so Simon Magus is an eight, in, in Acts 13, we read about another figure, Elimus, uh, who's described as, quote, a magician, literally a magi. All right, so here we have a magi. Who is he? He's a Jewish false prophet. So notice, you can be a Jewish magi. All right, so when we read the Gospel of Matthew, I think a lot of people just assume the magi are Gentile. Could they be Jewish? Well, it's at least possible, we'll come back to this, it's at least possible that they're Jewish. We know there were Jewish magi. Uh, from Acts. There's a, ma a magician, a Jewish false prophet. Now, interestingly enough, he's a magician. He's able to do amazing things. Paul later condemns him as, quote, full of deceit and villainy. We see that in this case, you have a magi 
who definitely has some kind of connection to supernatural powers, dark powers, but at the same time, he's a villain and he's full of deceit. He's a fraud on some level, right? So we have a kind of combination of you. So I've gone through all these different connotations of magi in the ancient world. Remember, Matthew may have one of these in mind. He may have a bunch of them in mind. They may be combined, right? So there's a lot of different possible meanings of magi. One thing that I'm going to insist on though, is that mad, the Magi in Matthew are most likely Gentile, right? Now, it's possible for Magi to not be Gentile. It's possible for them to be Jews, but there are some indications in Matthew's gospel that we should see these as non-Jewish figures. And here are a few things to consider. One, they're from the East. So their homeland is not the Holy Land. So that would seem to suggest, if you just describe people coming from the East, the natural reading would be that these are non-Jews. More interesting is who they say they're looking for. The king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. That's a very interesting title. Jews would not speak that way normal. In fact, in the Passion narrative, if you look at the story of Jesus' death in Matthew, it's the Romans who refer to Jesus as king of the Jews. Go to John's gospel sometime. Look up John 1, where we read about Nathaniel. He doesn't call Jesus the king of the Jews. Nathaniel is an Israelite. Jesus says, you are an Israelite indeed. Nathaniel is a Jew. He's an Israelite. Nathaniel calls Jesus the king of Israel. So there is a distinction there, right? King of Israel is the more common Jewish expression we see that that you would use if you were a Jew. And so the bystanders at the cross actually who are Jewish don't refer to Jesus as king of Jews. They refer to him as the king of Israel. There are other passages here that use that expression. And then finally, of course, at the end of Matthew's gospel, we read that the whole thrust of the gospel is leading Jesus to send the disciples out to go to all the nations. Jesus says in the Great Commission, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So many people have seen the Magi, thank you, Peter, that many people have seen the Magi as foreshadowing that Gentile mission. So I think they're most, and it says they went back to their own land, which is from the east. If they're Jews, that's probably not the way you describe it. So who are the Magi then? We know they're Gentile. What can we say more? Some people think that they're Persian. The earliest depiction, the earliest iconography of the Magi, and I'm sorry, that's not the earliest icon there, but the earliest depiction um, in the Church of the Nativity is actually of them being Persians. That's actually really significant. There's a little bit of a historical detail here worth pointing out. When the Crusaders came to Bethlehem, um, of course, there was that war, right? Muslims end up coming to Bethlehem. And during the time of the Crusades, the Muslims come and they actually raise a lot of the churches. They destroy a lot of the churches. And it's not like the Muslims are uniquely guilty of this because the Crusaders did a lot of bad things too, but that's another discussion for another day. One of the things that's interesting though, historical detail, when the Magi, I'm sorry, when the Persians went into the Church of the Nativity, the traditional site of Jesus's birth, ancient church, when they went into that church, they looked up and they saw a depiction of the Magi. It's what greeted them when they went into the church. And they were astonished because in the church, the Magi were depicted as Persians, right? Which is what you would expect in a certain way in the narrative. They're Magi, as I mentioned, Magi were associated with Persia. So what did the Islamic invaders do. They left the church untouched. It actually preserved that ancient church that is understood to be the site, the traditional site of Jesus's birth. They left it because of the Persian depiction of the Magi. Another possibility is that the Magi are Arabia. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why they my people have thought they were Arabian. This is found in early Christian writings. Justin Martyr, Tertullian, points this out. 
There's another possibility as well, and that is that the Magi are from Babylon. And I don't know where they're supposed to be from in Matthew's gospel any more than anybody else. But here's the one thing that if, if, if you forced me to give an answer, and it would just be an educated guess, I would lean towards the last option. The reason for that is, as I already showed you, there are Magi in Babylon. And if there's one thing we know about Matthew, he draws heavily from the book of Daniel. So Daniel is throughout the book of Matthew. When he's talking about the destruction, when Jesus in the gospel of Matthew chapter 24, he's talking about the destruction of the temple. He warns them about the desolating sacrilege as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, specifically quotes Daniel. So given Daniel's strong presence in the gospel of Matthew, if you got Magi, you ask me, the most natural reading is that Matthew's implying they came from Babylon, especially since Matthew 1 talks about the Babylonian exile. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's no, you know, de fide teaching on this. Biblical scholars are free to speculate about that. Um, let's talk a little bit more then about who the Magi are. All right, so the Magi are likely Gentiles. They are whether they're Persian, whether they're Babylonian, there's always this occult, there's always this connection to paganism. And Gentiles were generally seen in Jewish tradition as worshipers of the stars. It's a really common way uh, by the Babylonian Talmud's time it becomes standard. But I think even in Jesus's day, this would have been pretty common that the Gentiles worship the stars. So that connection with astrology is also important there. And so what ends up happening is in the early Christian interpretation of the Magi, we see a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the Gospel of Matthew. What does Jesus do? What's the essence of Jesus's message? I mean, if there's one thing, if there's one way to sum up Jesus's proclamation, it's what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, all right? And the gospel of Matthew is always the kingdom of heaven. Not always, but most of the time, kingdom of heaven. So in the gospel, Jesus is coming to call us to change our lives, all right? Jesus loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way, okay? And so it's significant to the early church fathers. We see this with Jesus and the tax collectors, for example. Jesus loves the tax collectors, but he loves them in order to change them, right? He loves them too much to let them stay in their sinful ways. And we see that with Levi, Matthew, right, in the gospel, who leaves that life, which was recognized as impure. Ma uh, tax collectors in Jewish tradition couldn't go into your house. They would render your house impure. That's how sinful they were. Okay? Normally, that doesn't happen with people. But tax collectors are almost in their own category. So, Origen, writing very early on, has a fascinating reflection on the Magi, which I think is worth highlighting here. Let's go back to the slide there. Okay, so this is now Origen. He's a very early Christian writer, so writing in the early 200s. This is what he says. Magi, and remember, Origen is an ancient Greek writer, so he's within the context of the ancient world. Magi are known to origin, right? And when he's talking about the Magi, he's not like, who are these guys, Magi? He knows, right? He says, Magi are in communion with demons. And by their formulas, invoke them for the ends that they desire. Jewish text, as I showed you, Magi associated with the occult. Matthew's a Jewish writer. Matt, if you take take off the slide for a second, one second, one second, Peter, let me speak to everybody. If you were to run into Matthew, okay, the author of this gospel that we're reading, and you were to say, Matthew, tell us about yourself. Matthew would say, I'm a Jew. Okay. Now, of course, Matthew follows Jesus. Of course, Matthew believes in Jesus, all right? Matthew doesn't think that that means he stops being a Jew, right? So when Paul talks to Peter in Galatians at Antioch, he says to Peter, we are Jews. He doesn't say we were Jews. In the book of Acts, when Paul's on trial, 
He says, I am a Pharisee. He doesn't say I was a Pharisee. Some people read some things that he says in uh, some of his letters to imply he's no longer a Pharisee, but that's not what he categorically says in the book of Acts. According to Acts, he is a Pharisee, right? And this is true of friends of mine today, Rosalind Moss, Moss, who's now Sister Miriam, you may know of her. Um, she doesn't say, I'm no longer a Jew. She still thinks she's a Jew. She just believes that everything that Israel was longing for is fulfilled in the Messiah. So Matthew is, I don't like to think of Matthew, you know, the, the big problem is where we celebrate the conversion of St. Paul. And that's not itself a problem. Conversion is a very important thing. But when people hear conversion, they think, oh, he's changing religions. Paul would never think of it like that. He believes in what the scriptures of Israel have announced. He doesn't think he's changing religions. That's not his. Some people point to a passage in Galatians where Paul says he advanced in Judaism. But there's all kinds of problems with that. Judaism doesn't mean like a religion in that context. Talk about that. Maybe another lecture sometime. But but Matthew's a Jew. And so as I showed you, in Jewish texts, what did we see? The Magi are linked to the occult, to demonic forces. So it's probable in my mind that that's in the back of Matthew's mind. Origen picks up on this and he says, Magi are in communion with demons and by their formulas invoke them for the ends that they desire. And they succeed in these practices so long as nothing more divine and potent than the demons and the spell that invokes them appears or is pronounced. But if anything more divine were to appear, let's go, the powers of the demons, thank you, would be destroyed. Now I put this in red and in italics so it would really stand out. Origen says, the effect of Jesus's birth was that the demons lost their strength and became weak. Their sorcery was confuted and their power overthrown. Accordingly, when the Magi wanted to perform their usual practices, which they had previously affected by certain, thank you, charms and trickery, they tried to find out the reason why they no longer worked, concluding that it was an important one. Seeing a sign from God in heaven, they wished to see what was indicated by it. Now, we don't know where Origen got this, right? This, is Origen aware of some ancient tradition possible? Is Origen deducing this from what he knows from Matthew? It's also possible. We don't know for sure. But what is significant, let's get to the core of this, is that for early Christian writers, the coming of the Magi represents the downfall of the spiritual powers. Right? And we're going to see that throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is in combat with Satan, and he's able to liberate people from demonic oppression. Right? And so, and we see this in the book of Acts, too, that the apostles are able to do things that the Magi are not able to do, like Elimus, right? Or Simon Magus. Simon Magus wants to buy the power Peter has in, in Acts 8. So what we see in Origin is a kind of full, kind of like fleshing out of this. That when the Magi come, they come recognizing they need to put aside whatever it is that they've done before and acknowledge the power of Christ. You know, and there's another passage from Ignatius of Antioch, and we, we're not going to get into it, Peter. I'm running a little behind and we started late, so I want to make sure I don't go over too much. But, um, Ignatius of Antioch also seems to indicate an awareness of the tradition. It's a little bit more oblique, but I did give you all a handout. So if you want to get into the details, I'm a scholar. I want to know where did people get their information? Are they making this up? Do they know what they're talking about? Um, so I, I just give you all the sources on the handout. Mine's all highlighted so that I know what Peter's going to put up on the slides. But anyway, it's the same basic handout um, and you can follow along if you want to download it. Anyway, all right, so why do people think of the Magi as we three kings of Orient are? Ever notice in Matthew's gospel, they're never called kings. So why, we know wise men, I talked about wise men. How do the Magi come to be understood as kings? Doesn't say that. 
What's going on? All right. So scholars have detected, and again, I would I would draw from Davies and Allison here. You see this is in the background, or Raymond uh, Raymond Brown in his infancy in his book on the um, the infancy narratives, the birth of the Messiah. He says this is just implicit in Matthew's text. Um, we see two important passages that seem to be in the background of Matthew's narrative. Right? What do the Magi do? They bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they come riding on camels. No, they don't. There's no camels in the Matthew narrative. So why is it that every time you've seen a picture of the Magi, come on, let's, you, I see you all, you're nodding. Every time you've seen pictures of the Magi, they're riding on camels, baby right? Not donkeys. If you saw magi come in on donkeys, you'd be like, whoa, that ain't magi, right? So why is it that the magi are always on camels? I'll tell you why. Isaiah 60. In Isaiah 60, we read the following passage. A multitude of camels shall cover you. In context, Isaiah is describing the future day of Israel's redemption. And in that day, Israel, who's been in exile, is going to be exalted by the Lord. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young male camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. And they shall bring gold. Oops, I made a mistake. That should be in red. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. And that should be all capital Lord there. Because we're talking about the name of the Lord God. It's a holy name revealed at Mount Sinai in the burning bush. Sons of a foreign country shall build up your walls and their kings shall minister to you that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. In the future day, when Israel is redeemed, a multitude of camels will come, and riding on these camels will be people bringing gold and frankincense. Now, Matthew highlights the gospel of Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, the gospel of Matthew highlights the book of Isaiah throughout, right? Jesus is born of a virgin because of Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus is Emmanuel, right? The one who is born of a virgin in um, Isaiah. In the Greek version, we have that prophecy of, anyway, the, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And we have other numerous other allusions to Isaiah in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, are you really going to tell me that Matthew, who knows Isaiah very, very well, is telling us about People coming and bringing frankincense and gold in the age of Israel's redemption. He's describing the redemption of Israel in Christ, right? He describes people coming from the east, right? From the places that are mentioned here, bringing gold and frankincense. And there's no connection to Isaiah 60. That's a stretch. Some people say, well, Matthew would tell you. He would be explicit and say, this is definitely from the book of Isaiah. That's not true. There are all kinds of subtle allusions in the Gospel of Matthew, the prophecies. For example, when Jesus is born, uh, it says he was, he was born, he ends up in Nazareth to fulfill the prophecy, he shall be called Nazarene. But there's no specific Old Testament prophecy that says he shall be called a Nazarene, right? Most scholars recognize here not a subtle allusion to Isaiah 11 where it talks about how a branch will grow out of the stump of David. David, I'm sorry, the stump of Jesse. Who's Jesse? You know, he's got that girl that everybody wants. I wish I had Jesse's girl. You know, that's a, man, no, no, it's not that, no, no, not that guy. Jesse is the father of David, right? And it looks like in David's day, I mean, sorry, in Jesus' day, it looks like there are no more Davidic kings. So, and even in Isaiah's day, it looks like the, the tree of Jesse, the family line of Jesse has been cut down. A branch will come out. In Hebrew, that word is netzer. So what do you call a person who's from Netzerreth, Nazareth, a Nazarene? So there's a very subtle allusion, it seems, to Isaiah. And we could talk about many other passages that are very subtle in Matthew. Matthew doesn't always do subtlety. 
He's very explicit in some places. In other places, he's more subtle. All right, another key passage, though, is from Psalm 72. In Psalm 72, we read, May the kings of Tarshish and of the isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him and all nations serve him. Now, if you actually look at the Greek between Psalm 72, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, and which is Psalm 71 in the Greek version of the Old Testament, and you look at the story of the Magi in Matthew 2, there are numerous echoes between the two. So in Psalm 72, in the Greek version, it says that the kings offer, they offer tribute, they, they offer gifts. And uh, that's the same word that's used in Matthew's gospel. Right? And they came and they offer. Um, we also read about gifts, Dora, it's actually the same Greek word. In Psalm 72, it actually says that they, they fall down. The Greek word there is from proskuneso proskuneo, which means to worship. It's the same word that's used in Matthew's gospel, right? And in um, Psalm 72, then, we have this image of these people coming to render gifts to the son of David. That's who Psalm 72 is about. Okay? So what's interesting about this is that you have two passages that talk about people bringing gifts there are lots of parallels between Psalm 72 and what happens. Psalm 72 begins a Psalm of Solomon. It's a Psalm that seems to be about, or it's at least connected to the son of David. Jesus is the son of David in Matthew's gospel. So on the one hand, you have these people coming to render to this figure who is who? The son of David, the royal son, the Messiah. What's interesting is in Isaiah, when you bring gold and frankincense, who are they bringing it to? Ultimately, they're coming to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Who is Jesus? Well, he's the son of David, but he's also Emmanuel. He's God with us. And I don't have time to get into all of this, but uh, it's very clear in the Gospel of Matthew that uh, Jesus is not just a human Messiah. Uh, at one point, he says that the day will come when people say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these great works in your name? Lord, Lord, the double use of Lord, Lord in the Greek Old Testament is only used for the God of Israel. So the, the simple word kurios, Lord, can be used to describe God, but it can also be used to describe any human king. But what Jesus does is he applies Lord, Lord, double use of Lord to himself. And there are lots of other indication, indicators that in Matthew, Jesus is something more than just human Messiah. If you want to go more on into that, um, you can go online on YouTube. I have a ton of short videos based on my book on Christmas, a ton of them. And they're just like short five-minute videos. Uh, and I have a whole treatment of Christ as Lord. And I show you some of these passages. All right. So Isaiah 60, they're coming to worship the Lord. In Psalm 72, they're coming to honor the son of David. Jesus is both. And who is it that comes? In both places, it's kings. And actually, the Magi could have had some kind of royal background. So, you know, they, they often have authority, not kings in the strictly literal sense. You should also remember that King Herod Antipas was a king in the strict literal sense in Jesus's day, right? He was kind of like a puppet king. Tetrarch would be a better term but he can still be called king, right? So king can be a, a loose term there. So in the tradition, this is why the Magi aren't just described as wise men, like Magi are in Daniel, they're also kings, right? Because of the implicit Old Testament connections. And that's also why they're on camels, right? So what do they bring? Well, what, what else can we say about the Magi? First of all, in the tradition, they're often described as three kings. Magi never says, Matthew never says there are three kings. How do we know there are three kings? Well, people say, well, because of three gifts. Well, actually, the earliest writer to say there were three magi is actually Origen, 
And Origen doesn't base his view that there are three magi on the fact that they have three gifts. He bases it on the idea that the story of Jesus and the magi visiting him is based on three pagans who come and visit Isaac in the book of Genesis. So that's why Origen thinks there are three of them. Later on, church writers will say, well, there are three gifts, so there must be three magi. It's not necessarily the case. Um, what, what, what can we say about the gifts? The gifts are gold, frankincense, and, more, and myrrh. And the early church fathers see great significance in these three gifts. Gold is typically understood to point to Jesus's divinity, his royalty. Frankincense, what is frankincense? A lot of people don't know what frankincense is. Frankincense is just incense. Just take Frank off of it. It's just honest incense. Just kidding. It's not honest, but it's, no, it's Frank incense. Anyway, incense is associated with what? Worship. Right? So gold for royalty, for Jesus as king, as divine. Frankincense to worship, which points to Jesus' divinity. And myrrh. Myrrh is typically associated with anointing, anointing priests, but it also is used for anointing someone at their burial. Now, in Matthew's gospel, myrrh is not used in the burial of Jesus. Right? But I do want to show you, and we'll talk about this at the end, how Matthew does connect the story of the Magi to Jesus' birth and see the Magi's foreshadowing Jesus' birth. So church fathers will see the, the myrrh as pointing towards Jesus. I'm sorry, not Jesus' birth, Jesus' burial. Right? So we'll see how Matthew points at the end here to the connection between the Magi and his their coming and Jesus' death, the passion narrative. So church fathers will see the Magi and they're giving of myrrh as a symbol of Jesus' coming sacrificial death. Now, uh, the first source to name the Magi is an Egyptian source, dates to the 500s. Uh, Bithysaria, Melchior, and Gaspar are the three names that are given. And they show up uh, also on a mosaic of a church in Ravenna. There you can see the image, Balthazar, Melchior, and Gaspar. Um, now, some people want to imagine, well, yeah, but we know then. Here, okay, it's 500, but it's fine. You know, we got we got the three names. The names kind of change over time. Uh, and we're not really sure where all the names come from. Uh, but in Syriac sources, interestingly enough, there were actually 12 magi, not three magi. So you can see the early Christians are trying to learn more about them or think through who these figures were. The overriding tradition in the West is summarized by pseudo Bede. People used to think this was a uh, venerable Bede, but we know now it wasn't written by him. But he sums up the Magi this way. And this is why the Magi look the way they do in all the, all the nativity sets that you've seen. Bede says the first is said to be Melchior, an old man with white hair and a long beard. Who offered gold to the Lord as to a king. So they see gold royalty. The second, Gaspar by name, young and beardless and ruddy complexioned. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Honored him, thank you. Honored him as God by his gift of incense. You see the incense as a sign of worship, pointing to his divinity and oblation, the sacrifice worthy of divinity. The third, black skinned and heavenly, heavily bearded, named Balthazar, by his gift of myrrh, testified to the son of man who was to die. So here you see all these traditions kind of come together, the myrrh pointing to Jesus's burial here. And what people want to do is recognize how the Magi foreshadow the Great Commission. So the Magi come from all the different peoples of the world so that we can see how all the peoples are drawn to Christ. Now, what about the star of wonder? People have wondered about the star. Let's take a look at what Matthew actually says about the star now. We read, for we have seen, Magi come to Jerusalem, they say, we have seen his star at its rising and have come to worship him. And when they had heard the king, 
they departed and behold the star which they had seen at its rising went before them until it came to rest over where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I'm quoting here. You might be wondering where the translation is. This is a new translation of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's called the Catholic Standard Version. And it's a big project that the Augustine Institute is heading up. And I'm very heavily involved in the translation project. We're doing the whole Bible. And um, uh, we've finished Matthew. This will be out for Word of God Sunday. Um, and anyway, working through all the books. But at least people can see Matthew. Um, hopefully it's a translation that uh, will make it easier to hear the Lord speak to you in scripture. But what is a star? So some people uh, have tried to interpret the star as like an actual natural phenomenon. And that really goes back to more recent times where, you know, in the early modern period, people were thinking more about stars and comets and things like that. Um, but the reality is this is no ordinary star. So people are like, well, it's Halley's Comet. Or, you know, there's some event that you can trace on the calendar. There's whole documentaries about this uh, where they say, okay, and we know it was this constellate, constellation of planets and this was the star. People who tell you these things don't know what they're talking about. It sells videos, but this is not the way. It's always astonishing to me that this is not the way that the early church fathers read the story. Okay. So let me let me read to you from uh, John Chrysostom. This is John Chrysostom. Uh, he's talking about um, what is going on there. You see an image of John Chrysostom. He points to the, the oddity of the story. He says, you know that a spot of such small dimensions could not possibly be marked out by a star. Let's say I'm inviting you all to my house. All right, I want you to come to my house. Here's the star my house is under. That's not going to work. Okay. It, I can't give you directions to my house by telling you to look up in the sky and it's the one under that one right over there. That's what Chrysostom is saying here, okay? So Chrysostom, okay, we can go back to the slide. You know that a spot of such small dimensions could not possibly be marked out by a star. For by reasons of its immense height, way in the sky, it could not sufficiently distinguish so confined a spot and reveal it to those who were desiring to see it. How then, John Chrysostom tells, says, tell me, did the star point out a spot so confined? Just the space of a manger and shed, unless it left that height and came down and stood over the very head of the child. Chrysostom is saying that the star had to be low. It had to come down from heaven. And in a lot of Patricia cases, they actually say the star came down over the child. When it says it came to rest over the child, it really literally means it came to rest over Jesus. How did the Magi know where to go? Because they could see the star move. And notice the star moves, you know, they, they follow the star and they end up in Jerusalem. And they're like, oh no, he's not here. And, and they say, go to Bethlehem. Now all of a sudden, the star can't, the star's moving around is the point, right? It's not like so low in the sky that it's clear where it is, they end up in Jerusalem, which is not, like it's not the same city as Bethlehem. That's a distance, right? So the star had to move. And we actually read that in the Gospel of Matthew. It's moving and then it comes to rest over the place where Jesus was. So Davies and Allison point out, let's go back to the scrolls in their commentary that in Jewish and Christian sources, angels and stars go together. You actually see this in the book of Revelation. So let's go to the next slide. In the Apocalypse, Jesus says, as for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Stop there. The seven stars are the angels. In the Gospel of Luke, how is Jesus' birth announced? By angels, right? And so Chrysostom and others 
make the case that the star should be understood like the stars are in other Jewish sources. This is no ordinary star. It's probably a manifestation of an angel in some way, shape, or form. Okay? But there's another thing to say about the star. Matthew indicates that Jesus's birth is announced by this important star. And scholars have long recognized that Matthew is most likely drawing on a famous prophecy. This is a prophecy that we find in the book of Numbers. It's uh, a prophecy from um, Balaam. Now, Balaam is a pagan. He's like a pagan seer. He's known as having wisdom in the sense of being able to divine things, but he's a pagan. So he's like a pagan who's a prophet, and he is a legitimate prophet. He gives legitimate prophecy. And Balak, this evil king, wants Balaam to curse Israel. And he says, all right, I'll pay you. So Balaam, all right, he's got no scruples. He takes the money. And then when he goes to curse Israel, I bless you, and blessings come out. And Balaam is, a Balak rather, is so frustrated. It's like, I paid you to curse them. And blessings come out. And Balaam's like, I'm sorry, I, I can't help it. I'm a prophet. And, I, you know, in other words, he can't control what he says. His prophecies aren't from him. They're from the Lord. And this is the climactic moment. He's like, okay, Balak's like, that's it. Does one time, blessing. Second time, blessing. Third time, Balaam utters this famous prophecy. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star, he says, shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be dispossessed. Now, this was an extremely popular prophecy in Jesus' day. We see this in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this was a passage people went to and they read as a messianic oracle. You see this, for example, in a work called the Damascus Document. Go back to the slide. That's a picture of the Damascus doc the document itself there, this fragment. And there we read, the scepter is the prince of the whole congregation. Who's that? It's the prince who's coming. It's the Messiah. All right. So what's really interesting about Balaam now is that in Jewish tradition, like in Philo, Balaam was remembered as a magi. So Matthew's telling a story about magi and star and the Messiah, and you start bringing these things together, and it seems very unlikely it's all a coincidence. In fact, um, in one Jewish tradition a little bit later, uh, uh, Balaam is remembered as the father of the Egyptian magi who went up against Moses. And when you read the birth story of Jesus, right, he's born during the reign of a tyrannical king who wants to kill all the Hebrew male children and the Hebrew, the, and, and he wants to kill them all at the time of a coming redeemer, right? And the redeemer is saved. Uh, who is this? When all the other Hebrew male children are killed. Story of Moses, story of Jesus, both, right? They're parallel here. So it would be very appropriate to see Balaam in the background, given that he was understood to be a Magi. Magi were associated with Moses. Magi were also known as astrologers, and um, it would make sense that Gentile astrologers would announce the birth of Jesus. Uh, we have ideas that Persian Magi announced the birth of great men like Alexander. Caesar's births, uh, like Julius Caesar, Augustus, they're linked with celestial signs their birth. Uh, even the birth of great figures in Jewish tradition like Noah and Moses are linked to stars. So, you know, Matthew's trying to show us Jesus is, Caesar, Jesus is king and Caesar is not. And so he really is the one who brings together all of these expectations of the royal figures announced by a star. Balaam's prophecy fits in beautifully with this, which is already messianic prophecy. One little detail most people overlook is in that prophecy of uh, number 24. Can we put that one back up one more time? I see him, but not now. I behold him, not near. A star, a scepter, so we have a Messiah. What's the last line? Edom shall be dispossessed. We always, people overlook every line in scripture is important. Edom shall be dispossessed. Come back off that slide there now. One of the things that's interesting about Herod, the great, who's the king at the time of Jesus' birth, is 
Herod was not an Israelite. Herod wasn't even a Jew. Herod was an Edomian, an Edomite. The Edomians were the descendants of Edom, Esau. Esau was the father of the Edomites, right? And the Jews understood that the Edomians were the descendants of Esau. So now you know why Herod is troubled. The Magi come and Herod says, who, who the Magi say, the king of the Jews. Herod's not a Jew. Right? In fact, uh, Antigonus the Hasmonean, according to Josephus, said that Herod was an idiot, an Idumean that is a half Jew, not a real Jew. Um, so it could be that the star was understood not just as announcing the coming of the Messiah, but the downfall of Edom, meaning the downfall of Herod's empire or his reign, which was already precarious because he wasn't a Jew to begin with. And so when the Magi comes seeking the king of the Jews, the Greek word there, Eudaioi, right? It, we translated Jews, but it's literally Judeans, right? And so Herod is not a Judean. So maybe that's part of the story. All right, last thing I want to say about this great passage. That is, I want to talk about the way it points to Jesus' death. Just very briefly, we see that when the Magi leave, of course, we have the slaughter of the innocents. And there are lots of parallels between the Magi story and the Passion narrative. Can we just go to the chart there um, that I put together? Let's just skip that. In the Magi story, what happens, the Magi come looking for he who is king of the Jews. In the Passion narrative, they ask, are you indeed the king of the Jews? In Matthew 27, hail, king of the Jews. When he's crucified, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And another key theme is in the Magi story, what does Herod do? He gathers together the chief priests and the scribes. And they, he wants to know, where is the Messiah to be born, according to them? Well, guess what? Throughout the Passion narrative, you have the chief priests and the elders. And what happens? They're gathered together, same Greek verb where you have the scribes and the elders and they're gathered together at Caiaphas's house. Or in Matthew 27, the chief priests and the elders are gathered together before Pilate. So the gathering together of these experts in the law and these leaders points forward to Jesus' death. So the Magi are reminders of the cost of discipleship. What do they do? They leave behind gold, frankincense, and myrrh. According to Origen, no more will they practice their dark arts, right? And that's tr Christian tradition. Um, let's go to the last slide, Peter. Last slide from Leo the Great. Leo points out, it was, Leo points out that in the gospel narrative, it says that Ma the Magi figured out that Herod was on to them and wanted to use them to kill Jesus. So they went home, quote, by another way. This is what Leo the Great says about that. Love this commentary. It was proper that now believing in Christ, they should not walk through the paths of their old way of life, but enter upon a new path and abstain from the wanderings they left behind. What do the Magi do? They come home by another way. And that is a lesson to all of us, right? We are to be changed when we encounter Christ. And Matthew doesn't say what Origen says, that they gave up all their dark arts and things like that. But it does seem that they come to recognize the truth, that the true king is born in Judea, and they honor him, foreshadowing the Gentile mission. And all of us Gentiles who come to worship Jesus, now we recognize that that revelation is going to involve a call to suffering, right? We see that foreshadowed in the story of the slaughter of the innocents. The revelation of the Messiah also comes with suffering. And so Jesus' ultimate revelation of his work of redemption comes on the cross through his suffering. We too are going to be called to go home a different way after encountering Christ. And I think that's what the Magi teach us. All right, I could say a lot more, as you can imagine. But uh, I went over a little bit. I started late, though, so I did go over. Doctor, you're great. We love it. We love it. Th Fantastic. We really appreciate you uh, sp spending time with us this evening. We know you're quite busy. You got your 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 hands in lots of projects and um, six kids at home too. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's wonderful. Last time you checked, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's great to have you with us, Doctor. Is our 
finale, the culmination of our first quarter of our curriculum here, here, as we prepare for the coming of Christ in the flesh. It's just a blessing to cap all of this off by spending this time with you, uh, reflecting on the gift of the Magi. And um, if I know we started a little late, so I know, and with six kids at home, I don't know how your schedule is looking, but would you have just a few minutes yeah, to stay okay. with us? Yeah, right? we can stay. Yeah, definitely. Just on the timing of this story, did the Magi come at the time of the birth of Christ or later? Some folks have heard, you know, different, different versions of the story. Sure. Yeah, it does not seem that they're there the night of Jesus's birth. Why do we think that? Well, when Herod instructs the Magi, he, he actually questions them. And in the Greek, it's like he's interrogating them. He really wants to get the details right. It seems that it's been a while since they've seen the star. And the star announces Jesus's birth. And so he has all the children two years in younger killed. So it's been some time since Jesus was born. This is not the night of the nativity for almost certain, right? So it's it's going to be um, later than that, up to two years. We just don't know. Doctor, um, the question come in, why did they come to worship Jesus in the first place? If the Magi are not Jews, why would they want to worship the king of the Jews? Right. That's a great question. Well, it would seem that what Matthew wants to indicate is that <laughs> the, uh, the Magi recognize that this is a unique figure because he has a unique star that announces his birth right? So the, the appearance of the star is really significant. Now, I just got to say, we don't know for sure. Matthew's a Jew. We know that. And we know that there are Jewish connections between that prophecy of Balaam and the Magi. And so it, it Balaam and Magi are connected. So it, it there are these later traditions that the Magi actually somehow knew of Balaam's prophecy because they were related to him. That's fascinating, very interesting, very creative too, possibly. We don't know uh, uh, more than what the New Testament tells us. Now, it does say that they came and they worshipped him. Now, that word that's used for worship, proskuneo, doesn't have to mean adoring God. It can simply be the honor that you give to a king, right? So it's hard to know exactly what the Magi think they're doing, right? Just on its own by that one word. What is fascinating is just shortly after this, we read about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. And what does Satan say? If you worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And it's the same word for worship. And here Jesus says, no, you shall worship the Lord your God. Him only shall you serve. And in that passage, proskuneo is used to describe the worship that is only given to God. So in Isaiah, the people who come and bring frankincense and gold, they're coming to worship God, right? The Lord. And so that Matthew thinks that when the Magi come, I think he's he's got that passage in the back of his mind. And I think it's very clear. Matthew understands Jesus is God. He's the Lord, the God of Israel. And in other places, the disciples worship Jesus and they're not just treating him like a king. They, there's more to it than that, right? He's more than just a human figure. In, fact, in the narrative, Jesus is already described as Emmanuel, God with us. Is it possible that the Magi were worshiping Jesus and they don't really see him fully for who he is? But Matthew understands in light of the resurrection uh, that this has greater significance and points to Jesus' divinity. The Second Vatican Council would show us that in, in Dave Erbum that the Gospels are written with the fuller perspective that we have after the resurrection, right? So it might be that Matthew's drawing that connection out. It's a little hard to say for sure. Can't really get inside their heads. Matthew doesn't really tell us what they're thinking. So um, this is stuff that we can speculate about and Right. On. And it's what you can think about for 10 Hail Marys when you pray in the nativity, uh, the mystery of the nativity. Think about that for 10 Hail Marys. You know, there's not enough Hail Marys to think about all the things that you can think about during the mystery of the nativity. 
Doctor, just a follow up on that um, um, regarding the possibility that they they had some other knowledge, uh, you know, so, some way of coming to know who who this was. Question comes in: Would B the Babylonian wise men or magi have had access to the writings of Daniel, and would that have given them an understanding of the coming Messiah? Matthew might think so. I don't know. Uh, I really. We just now we're. We're just, you know, speculating. So we just don't know. And, you know, it, it's not just what would have happened. It's what does Matthew think? And right. you know, what people are never satisfied with what we get in the gospel story. I, I've tried to give you a lot, give you a lot of things to think about that are actually rooted in the gospel story. Like, for example, the connection with Balaam. I think that connection is pretty, pretty that strong. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And, the star the prophecy there which was so important to jews in jesus's day so i've tried to give you stuff to think about people aren't satisfied with that and they want to get into details so they'll look at you know the private revelations of various mystics that are not inspired they're often not written by the people that they're attributed to and they often are contradictory too so like you read you know mary of agrida and you read catherine emmerich and they 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 don't always, they're contradictory, right? You can't just reconcile them, right, in some way. So um, this is why the church doesn't endorse, you know, like in Catherine Emmerich's visions are not, they were excluded from her canonization pro process. And there are, there are really troubling things where she just doesn't understand the geography or where she says that, um, she says something to the effect that uh, people with black skin are black skin because of the sin of Cain. And that all the noble races are light skinned. Uh, she didn't say that. I don't think Anne Catherine Emmerich said that, but her, the guy who wrote it all down and edited stuff, he put a lot of his own ideas. We know that guy who wrote those visions down was actually a German nationalist later. So, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, you gotta be careful with those private revelations and these <laughs> stories and things like that. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And thank you for, and it's, it's incredible to see the different subtleties that you're bringing out in no. Matthew, you know, when he's not being obvious, I, I love your point about connecting the, um, the star and the angel. Cause of course, a lot of us have a Christmas tree topper. It's one or the other, and it's cool to see that they're actually signifying probably right, the, the angel reality. or the star. That's right. You put an angel or a star at the top of the tree. Well, maybe it's both. Right. And that, that actually is rooted in Christian interpretive tradition that the star was actually an angel in disguise, right? So that's why it's it's kind of, there. it's an either or of the angel or the star. That's great. Sister Margaret Therese is asking about your, your uh, connection to Isaiah 60. If, if Isaiah mm -hmm. mentions kings from Midian, Ephah, and Sheba, could the three Magi have been from there? Where do you, uh, right. Where do you I meant to mention that. Them? So uh, some people think they were uh, from... Uh, Arabia because of that reference there. So there are just lots of ways you can connect them to different places. And we just don't know. I mean, and all, you got to understand too, that in Jesus's day, places that are mentioned in the Old Testament are understood as symbolic of places in the New Testament, right? So um, Edom is actually a reference to Rome in rabbinic sources. Right. How does that work? Uh, Edom is not Rome, but it becomes a symbol of Rome. Uh, and so that happens in lots of other ways, too. So uh, you got to be careful about it's not just what does the text say? Remember, Vatican II says we need to interpret the text in light of the context in which they're written. And so when Peter talks about she who is at Babylon, right, in one of his letters, he's not talking about the actual Babylon. It's talking about Rome, because in Jesus's day and Peter's day in the New Testament times, for Jews, Babylon could also be a symbol of Rome, right? So it's hard to know how to put together some of these sources. It's a bit of a mystery. Doctor, this has been fantastic. We know you got to get back to your uh, to your family. We very much appreciate you being with us. We're going to link. Pat is asking if we can uh, link the title of your book uh to our follow-up email we certainly will do that oh please do that i would appreciate Absolutely. that please do consider this is a christmas gift um my my real heart is for 
And we've really tried to make the books available. You can also get paperbacks. You can get bulk paperbacks from the Augustine Institute at catholic.market. So you can get, you know, like a box of them at a real low price. Parishes give them away at Christmas time. Uh, last year, we went through 150,000 copies. So uh, it's great people. And this is the, the second printing. So the second printing has some new pictures and charts and a few more details and footnotes and things like that. So I updated it a little bit. Um, and the hardcover is really nice. They did a beautiful job. Even the, the cover has this nice title on it. But my hope is that, you know, people will buy the hardcover because people are more likely to read a hardcover. So if you give it to somebody who's maybe kind of not sure about what they believe or maybe they, they're, they've they got questions about is the story about Jesus just mythology or whatever, hopefully this book will will help address those things and give you an opportunity to share the faith. Thank you.